Okay, hi everybody. Hello. So we have at least one English speaker, right? Or you, you can speak German as well? Uh, English. English, I thought so. <laughs> so uh, we probably have a mixed presentation, so Alex will present in German, he said. And uh, everybody else who would prefer German, he can do in German as well. But uh, mainly it will be in English, of course. Uh, and uh, yeah. Great location, right? Yes. So, guys from Block 42 invited us here and also offered the beer, so give him a big round of applause. <laughs> I think it's also a good thing that we have a different location, so I hope we can do that more often to find other locations as well. So, if somebody's here who has a location, that might be a nice offer to have the next blockchain up at your location as well. So, um, getting around a bit and have a little bit kind of a, yeah, a mix, mixing of people as well. And we have a lot of new people here, as far as I have seen, at least a couple of new faces here as well. So, we were surprised that we have so many people here. Uh, cool to see you. Uh, the thing regarding blockchain up, so who has never been to a blockchain up meetup yet? Okay, a couple of words to the blockchain up in Graz. Uh, founded somewhere uh, 2016, so three years ago. And we are doing blockchain uh, meetups uh, since then. So that's the 30th meetup. Quite regularly, about every month, some kind of uh, breaks in the summer or during Christmas uh, and try to go through all the kind of different kind of systems we had at the very beginning. We all want to know how blockchain works. And uh, now we are getting more and more in applications and and uh, yeah, and the things what we do here in the in this team in in uh, in Graz as well as some some guests here and here and then. So Salamantex came from Vienna and uh, so we have mostly local startups but also of guests here uh, who are presenting and I think Philip is most of the time in Vienna as well uh, but you will hear more about that uh, there as well so we have changed the format a bit so we have rather short presentations um, today so 15 minutes max 20 minutes per presentation so that we uh, can still drink a couple of beers afterwards and nobody has to go home immediately um, yeah, so uh, thank you for hosting us here and may you continue and uh, I can relax and sit back and do just my 20 minutes presentation later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, Thomas, for initiating the blockchain hub here in Graz. As I said, it's the furthest time approximately, mm -hmm. and which is really a big number, I guess. So um, back three years ago when nobody really know, knew about blockchain Thomas uh, started all the thing and I think it's really good to see that even in a, such a small city like Graz um, such a great community exists and yeah today we decided to to team up to do the first blockchain up which is not hold in the lab 10 I guess it's the first time so I'm really glad to welcome you to our place here. Um, maybe you have seen it when you entered the room. Um, there are a couple of, of logos on the walls. Um, we are here uh, at the Moshpit uh, corporate. Uh, Moshpit consists of three companies. Um, the first one is Studo. Uh, Studo is a student app and was the yeah, initial company which was founded by the Moshpit GmbH. And all of you who started in a couple of last years maybe used the Studio app um, as well. The second company which is located here is Dalto, uh, Talents of Tomorrow. It's an employer branding company which is built right now. And the third company is Block42, our company, which is focusing on blockchain technology. We uh, have two business units. The first one is about investing in other blockchain ventures. So we collected a uh, small amount of money which we reinvest in other companies uh, where we see a great potential in it. And the second business unit is about 
digital solutions. So we do consulting and development services for corporates, but also for startups, which would like to get in, in contact with blockchain technology. Um, Energie Steiermark is one of our customers, for example, where we implement together a peer-to-peer -peer energy trading use case. Um, today, Chris uh, will tell you something about our prototype, the um, proof of concept in the legal sector. Uh, I married last year in August, and me and my wife, we decided, okay, let's do a, a wedding contract, but do not it in a classical way, but put it on blockchain. And so we implemented the first smart wedding contract. Um, yeah, it was pretty cool for us because um, a, lot of, a lot of news sites, a lot of newspapers wrote about the story, and we as block 4 do got a, a pretty, pretty much um, attention for it. And yeah, Chris will go in detail how the technical implementation works for all of you which um, do not know how a smart contract is coded, how the setup works, um, you will hear um, more about in, in the next couple of minutes. Just one thing to add, organizational stuff, over there you have the fridge, you can get free beer out of that. If you would like to drink non-alcoholic beverages, you can um, do that also. Just throw in two euros in the, the class over there or just send us a Bitcoin or Ethereum transaction. The QR code is over there. <laughs> and I hope you enjoy this evening and thank you that you're here. So, hi and welcome. Um, as Lucas or, also uh, already introduced us, um, we are Block32 and my name is Chris and I am a co-founder of Block32. And last year we implemented kind of a prototype with our smart wedding contract as we called it. And I want to show you how we did it and yeah, what's the current state with it. So basically the idea behind the smart wedding contract was um, at the moment, um, based on Austrian law, you need a normal marriage contract, the civil law. It's like an old paper written contract, if you want to call it like that. And on the other hand, we have a Ethereum smart contract and we wanted to connect those two parts to each other. And um, we did that in cooperation with Stadler and Ferkel. It's a law firm based in Vienna. And we figured out that we need some kind of a user manual for the smart contract. So it really fits the legal purpose. Um, what the user manual actually is, it's an attachment to the civil law marriage contract which contains the Ethereum addresses for example from the husband and the wife and also some sort of like um, the smart contract can also hold ETH like it's kind of a saving account and such things are regulated or de defined in the um, attachment of the smart contract yeah, and so I want to go into detail into how we implemented the stuff on the Ethereum side because that's the most technical side, the other thing is just law. So the software stack um, we used, um, as said, it's a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain, so we used Solidity to implement the smart contract. We used Ganesh, it's kind of the Ethereum RPC, like um, with Ganesh, you can run a local Ethereum chain on your laptop and then you can develop on it because the development workflow looks something like that. You develop on your local machine, so on your laptop. Then if it's kind of ready, you can deploy it to a public testnet, like for example the public Robson testnet. And if that also works without bugs and without any um, issues, you can deploy it to the live Ethereum mainnet. The reason for that is um, if you develop on the Ethereum mainnet or if you deploy to the Ethereum mainnet, everything costs real money. And on a test setup, nothing. it costs basically nothing because it's not real, or it's not on the Ethereum main chain. Then we also use Truffle. It's kind of a framework to develop Ethereum smart contracts. You, it's the whole stuff to build smart contracts and to debug them. Then we also make use of IPFS. That's the interplanetary file system, like to store files in a decentralized manner. 
we use that for the written smart contract, ah, the written smart contract, the written marriage contract, because we also need a written version. Um, so all the parties and also a judge, for example, can validate all those rules and if everything is in place. And on the front end side, we use Bootstrap for the UI, Web3 for the communication from the front end to the blockchain, and also Truffle because you need to integrate um, the smart contract side with Web3. Yeah, and I want to jump right into a demo. So right now we have a few things here set up. This is Ganesh, I, as I explained earlier. This is kind of a Ethereum network on the local machine right now and it contains three Ethereum addresses. Um, the second one is, I guess, from the husband and the third one is from the wife. <laughs> and the first um, Ethereum wallet is used to deploy the smart contracts to the local testnet. And on the other side we have the code. I'm not sure if you can read it right now, but we just deploy it. So right now, what I'm doing is I'm compiling the smart contract, or I'm compiling the Solidity file and deploying it to the local Ethereum testnet on the laptop. And now I'm starting the frontend. Mm. Okay, so now you can see in the blockchain we mined one block, so we actually mined the first block. The blockchain is currently configured like that. Um, it mines transactions on demand, so they are mined instantly, not every 15 seconds, like on the main chain. Yeah, um, like on the main chain, but on demand. And as you can see, we now created a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain, and the user front end looks something like this. It shows on the upper left side, the smart contract address, how many ETH or how many Ethereum tokens are actually in there, the wallet addresses of the husband and the wife, and on the other side it shows which user is currently logged in into the front end. Um, and as a wallet I'm using MetaMask. And as you can see, there are three wallets. The wallet I used for deploying the smart contract and husband and wife wallet. And what we can now do... So I'm now logging in to the husband. So I'm now logged in as the husband and I'm uploading the written smart contract. It's already lying on IPFS and I'm supplying the IPFS hash like here. You can see here and you can validate it. This is the written, smart, uh, the written contract, the written marriage contract. It's just an example because it's on the testnet. And there are, de there are determined a few things. And now the thing is, um, the smart contract is configured in the way that every time the husband and the wife must confirm a certain transaction. Like for example, the husband uploaded the written contract now to um, the smart contract. And now also the husband and the wife both must accept the terms. Because it's like in the old way, if you have a marriage contract, both the husband and the wife must sign the contract for it to be valid. And now I'm going to log in with the wife and sign the contract with both spouses. And then we can see on the downside there are a few events. These are the events of the smart contract. Um, and then you can see what's happening and what's going on. The reason for that why we implemented a smart contract um, or a smart wedding contract is you have um, an unchangeable history of events, what happened. And so afterwards if the spouse is divorced, um, they cannot say no, I have not accepted this or I have not accepted that because it's written on the blockchain and no one can change it anymore. Yeah. <coughs> so I'm now signing with the husband the contract. It's kind of if you sign it by hand. I'm just uh, signed 
the contract digitally. And now I'm doing the same thing um, as the wife. And you can now see that both spouses have signed the contract and now it's uh, in the state signed. And now a few other features are enabled. Um, basically everyone can send ETH to the contract. It's kind of a saving account and the couple can use um, the money in it to spend, for example, to go shopping, to go dining or to buy a house or a car or something like that. And the other thing which can be done is to add assets to, into the contract. Because in a marriage, um, for example, the couple buys a house, but the wife pays for 80% of the house and she also wants to keep 80% of the house afterwards if they divorce. And so um, they can control everything in this smart contract. And let's do an example with the house. So as you can see, the stuff is pretty simple. It's just a text field at the moment, so like a kind of house. And um, the, the Aufteilung <laughs> be, uh, between wife and husband. And you can see the wife. So for example, the current um, allocation is the wife owns 80% and the husband owns 20%. And now the wife can suggest an asset, like as you can see down here, the wife has suggested to add the house into the smart contract and now the husband has to confirm the action. So as always, both spouses need to sign the contract in order for it to be valid. signed the contract, you can see it's the status changed to edit and you can see the house or the asset which added and also the allocation between wife and husband. And the, couples, uh, the couple can also decide um, to delete the asset again. So it's just removed um, from the asset table, but it's not removed from the events um, on the downside. So even after a few years, you can also you can always validate what happened and no one of the spouses can change what happened actually because it's written into the blockchain and yeah um, the other thing is i think i'm running out of time um, what other feature you can add or we added is you can as i said you can send eve into the contract and then it acts kind of a savings account and for example if the couple decides to divorce um, it may be then that it's still 100 ETH into the account, in the account, which is at the moment I think around 30k dollars. And what happens if both, cup, uh, if both spouses decide to divorce is the balance gets um, divided in half and automatically sent to the wife and to the husband or to the previous wife and to the previous husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so the end state is um, hopefully they do not divorce, but if they divorce, um, everything can be looked up in the table below, everything what happened, and for example, a judge can yeah validate what happened, and everything should be happy. Uh, everything should be fine, and everyone should be happy. Yeah, <laughs> that's basically it. I think we do a couple of questions because they are all very different, uh, all <laughs> presentations. So like couple of questions, maximum five minutes, uh, so that, go ahead. Part of wedding vows is till death uh, do us part. Uh, sorry? Part of wedding vows is till death do us part, so can they die in the contract? Uh, at the moment, no. It's just a very simple prototype, um, but you can implement a feature like, for example, the husband and the wife, so each of the spouses, they need to log in or they need um, to prove they are still alive, like there are a few other projects working on that um, problem like inheritance and so maybe the wife and the husband they need to log in once a quarter or once every six months so they prove hey I'm still alive and if they miss it yeah they, then they die in smart contract so maybe it's not the optimal solution but it could be a solution but at the moment it's not working. I'm not sure if you mentioned this but the, the actual contract that's around the media was um, both. So, Lucas, 
Yeah, Lucas had a real wedding and he has a real smart wedding contract on the Ethereum main chain. And we're um, still married. Are you sure? Go so. <laughs> take a contract. <laughs> yeah, so maybe um, I forgot I have some more slides. So what we actually wanted to do is to create a more digital, uh, a digital, more dynamic version of a smart of a marriage contract. Um, what happened is we got a great response from the community, and we also got a few requests, like if we do that also for others. Um, yeah, as I said, it's only a prototype, so there is not much functionality yet, but it could be improved. And based. In the end, our goal was to show what's possible with Ethereum or with smart uh, contracts. Yeah, and I think we did that pretty well. And if you're interested in more, um, you can head over to our website, blockfreedutotex slash smart wedding contract. Um, the code, so the front end and also the smart contract stuff is open on GitHub and we also published a blog post on Medium. And you can also try it yourself. Um, just go to blockfreedutotex.uber.space. Um, you can use Robson and the Ethereum mainnet and you can play around with it and you find um, instruction manual on the GitHub. So because the assets are also encrypted, like symmetrically encrypted via AES, and you find the password also on the GitHub. And if you have any questions afterwards, you can talk to me or you can hit me up on Telegram. Yeah, sorry, Phil? Yeah. And then I see the transaction for the value contract. I can go over the value contract, right? Sure, yeah. And then I will see all the assets, the value contract, so I know every asset in the value contract. Nope. Uh, as I explained right now, um, they are encrypted, like symmetrically encrypted. So visually encrypted, so you can't see Yeah, they are really encrypted. So no plain text is written to the blockchain, and only the couple knows the, the password. Um, yeah, and at the moment we implemented it with an only pa a password, like a, a short string, whatever you want to choose. Um, but the idea was, because you already have an Ethereum wallet, you can use that wallet to actually encrypt the stuff, but that was not implemented in the Web3 library at the moment, so we decided to go with the simpler way <laughs> and not implement it ourselves. So, I say thank you to your nice invitation. When I ask you, are you sure, uh, I mean it uh, really. Uh, my question is, I will miss a, a very important uh, third position. Austria called Notar, and the position and the, and the, the uh, job of the Notar is to take uh, clear that you are, what's your identity? The second is, are you able to do business? The, the third is, is the contract legal? Is this contract allowed? And then uh, this contract will be uh, written. That uh, you are absolutely, that's absolutely clear that you have uh, understanding this contract. Yeah, sure. And uh, everything else is not a contract in this thickness of a wedding, uh, in which uh, I, I missed this uh, position of this uh, notar. This notar is also a clear instance if something is in the contract and uh, I will say some years in later there is uh, some, uh, I will say, knowledge that uh, something uh, uh, was sought at the wedding is not a part of the reality. Therefore, I will miss... Uh, yeah, you are absolutely right. Uh, so at the moment, um, the thing is we have a a, civil, uh, a marriage contract by civil law and also the kind of user manual and those are this document which is uploaded to IPFS uh, is notarized so it's signed by a notar um, and that's the current state uh, but actually what we wanted to do or what we wanted to show is you don't need a notar anymore maybe somewhere in the future and like there are projects for example like open law which already um, serve sort of kind of like contract templates and if those contract templates are validated by other um, Anwälte lawyers um, you actually everyone could use it over a simple, uh, a simple interface like a simple web interface 
and deploy such a contract. And the thing with identity is, I think we are going pretty fast uh, towards self-sovereign identity, and then you already sol uh, also solve this issue. Because you're on the blockchain, and everyone, for example, knows this is, this is your identity, this, this is your is wallet. Identity, right? that, yeah. What you need, and check instead uh, if, the, if the, the, the contract is uh, allowed, if the contract is well be understood by the partners, by the woman and the Yeah, sure. At the moment, it's that way. I'm not sure if it's still in 20 years like that. But at the moment, you need a nota and sign it with a nota. So, let's move on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes, if you're looking for the for the toilet it's, it's downstairs in the fourth floor just um, when you when you enter the room you put some some signs on it I was told I should rather stand here so that I, I'm heard as well on the live stream. So uh, we have a Facebook live stream. Yeah. In the Ethereum group. Okay. Very, very good. Very good. Okay, just keep in mind, uh, don't talk to your screen, talk to us. Yes, I try to talk to you as much as possible. But of course, I, I have to look at my screen and uh, every now and then I, I try to refer to it. So, good. Um, from my side, I will talk um, a bit about what we do, what we are, and where we are currently at. Uh, so, first of all, uh, the Lab 10 Collective is a uh, common goods cooperative. So, we are a cooperative with 40 members, and we are, um, yeah, we established the company two years ago. Uh, and basically we are quite a large blockchain operation here in Graz um, and uh, we are working on sustainable blockchain solutions in the e-mobility and in the renewable energy sector. Uh, at some point we had to come to that kind of decision on what to concentrate so we took the largest space possible energy and mobility and walked right into this one. And uh, as everybody knows, climate change uh, is real. So we are focusing on zero carbon uh, activities in various kind of uh, directions within that sectors. Um, talking about sustainability, that's also quite a, um, yeah, not, not frequently discussed kind of thing. You know that term, but uh, what we mean with sustainability is uh, that uh, it should be economically sustainable, ecologically sustainable, and also social sustainable. And that uh, fits well to, uh, to uh, our direction towards zero carbon, because basically if we are facing a climate change as it is prognosed, uh, we are definitely not having a social stability, uh, no economical stability and no ecological stability. So uh, from that perspective, this is right into it where we want to work um, and to give you a, a, a sense of what we're working on um, we have these slides so to show you the stack what we're using so we consider Ethereum as basically the first layer as a decentralized uh, financial system so you will if you're getting more into Ethereum you will see that a lot of applications are developed in the lending space in this uh, stablecoin space and so on so you will have more and more assets on the Ethereum blockchain which are generated there which can be uh, kind of moved there but on the other sides um, I think Lucas just said it uh, or uh, Christian just said it it's quite expensive if you're uh, if you're moving assets on the Ethereum blockchain so if you do that quite frequently it becomes quite 
a uh, yeah expensive task what you're doing. So uh, we consider uh, the artist blockchain as a second layer sidechain to Ethereum, which is connected via bridges with the uh, with the Ethereum blockchain, and where we can move assets back and forth between uh, artists and Ethereum, where you can do cheaper transactions on the Ethereum blockchain and uh, generate a kind of scalability layer for uh, doing that kind of stuff uh, on the artist blockchain. Um, on top of that, you need wallets. You, you need somehow to access uh, the, the blockchain systems. You need wallets. Uh, and those are called, in our case, uh, Minerva. So Minerva could be something like that, which is a wallet. But it could be also something on your mobile phone. Uh, and you have a browser wallet, for example, which is called Minerva Cache in our case. So you have, you open the browser, you go on a website, you have already a wallet. And you can move the assets uh, which are on the artist blockchain with that particular wallet. Of course, you can use uh, NFC with that card. You can kind of connect the card with, the, with an application and move the assets from that as well. So basically, that's the important layer when you move assets on a, on a blockchain itself. And basically up there, there comes the applications. So the applications there, they need all the, the lower parts, but you might have an application and don't know that you're interacting with blockchain uh, at lower levels. But basically there is where we do the, do the applications. And in our case, it's, it's mobility and, and energy. So when we talk about the infrastructure area, and I said I will just talk about artists uh, today, uh, one important thing uh, happened uh, a couple of months ago, we partnered with POA Network. Uh, POA Network is having the POA uh, chain, so they have a, a blockchain themselves with the POA token and they have uh, launched the XDAI chain, uh, which is quite well known. Uh, basically, you move a stable token from Ethereum to the XDAI chain via a bridge and can interact with a, with a wallet. We did something similar. Uh, we moved also via a bridge uh, DAI to the artist blockchain and you, we, we demonstrated how you can kind of move that token in a seamless fashion from one wallet to the other. And uh, together with, uh, with POA, uh, we, well, we, we kind of worked with uh, artists in a way that all our validators, the ones which do the block, the, the block generation, with the ones which put the transactions into the blocks, um, they're permissioned in the case of, of artists. So basically you need 4.5 million ATS, some Austrian crypto shilling, if you, if you recall it. Uh, so you need 4.5 million ATS and uh, you put that into a smart contract and then you can become a validator. Uh, but you have to be voted in right now. And that's quite a hurdle. So basically it's not really a permissionless system. So uh, what we said, we need to go permissionless to basically uh, make it yeah, uh, a broader distributed kind of system and make it simple for somebody who wants to run a validator node uh, on the artist blockchain. So, but running a validator node should not be kind of just make it permissionless and take, it, take whatever is out there. Uh, we're going uh, to have a, a, a network upgrade. Some say hard fork. We like network upgrade better. It's a, it's a nicer term. And it's not so kind of misleading in some respects. And because we are in the, la in the year of the moon uh, landing 50 years ago, and we, our servers are called according to planets. So we have a Mars and Sooner Venus server. So we said we go for moons for our upgrades. Because the largest moon is the moon of the Earth, so we have the moon upgrade. So whenever you're called, uh, you ask when moon, you say November, likely. So we will have the moon upgrade in November. <laughs> um, 
So what we're doing, uh, it's the, uh, we are introducing a new kind of system of staking. It's called POS DAO. And we reduce the stake uh, you need as a minimum stake for running, running a validator node. It's 750k uh, ATS. Um, and then we, the ones which can't afford uh, that, much, that many ATS, uh, they uh, can delegate some stake onto validators which run nodes. So you can basically stake on other nodes via the Blockchain Explorer. And uh, currently we run as a consensus algorithm, so basically the, the, all the validators, they run currently uh, authority round, so Aura, and we are changing the consensus algorithm as well. And that's, uh, I think it's a basically world first, uh, running Honey Badger consensus. Um, the Honey Badger consensus is very interesting because it's, um, it's a consensus where you have a very, very high censorship resistance because even the validators themselves don't know which of transactions will be in the block at the very end. Because even to them, it will be revealed at the very end. So they don't know what will be in the block uh, when it's finally shown to everybody and then it's impossible to change it anymore. Um, it is also quite a performant uh, uh, consensus algorithm. So uh, according to the white paper, uh, it must be very performant. So we will see. Um, and we're, we're, we're looking forward to the first performance tests. And because basically the first test net with the Honey Badger integration into Parity started yesterday. So we don't have the performance yet because we were implementing over months now. Uh, one of our colleagues, he was uh, deeply immersed into kind of this uh, integration. So since yesterday, we had the first uh, fully integrated multi-node uh, network running uh, with Honey Badger integration. And, uh, and now it's going forward to, let's say, fix a couple of things you will realize when you have the first test net running and of course, uh, getting more and more into uh, into the performance uh, optimization and, and finding out how, how good it is and how we are going to transition uh, when we finally uh, do the network upgrade. So if you are interested to join our team, we have a couple of open positions. So just talk to us later. And thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Uh, how do I get ATS tokens? Um, we will have a private sale uh, somewhere in September, October. Uh, and because we are on live stream, and, or not on live stream, but on camera, which will be published, I cannot tell any details. Otherwise, it would be public offering. So, uh, yeah, we are having a private sale in, in, in autumn, and there will be some more information to the ones which are interested in the private sale, uh, what is to come for the whole pipeline. So, it's not the last thing what we have currently. We have a plan for the next year, so what we're doing and what we expect for the token. And so everybody who's interested, just approach me afterwards. Anything else? Question? Question? No? Okay. So let's go on. Thank you. So, who is going to be next? Uh, is it? Yes. I think Philip. It's you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you.
from my side. Um, thanks Lab 10 and Thomas for having me here today. Um, we're quite different to Lab 10 and the artist chain. They're going for sustainability, that's not what we are doing. <laughs> we try to make business <laughs> and have a startup which is called Hero. I'm one of the founders and the CTO of the company. And I will talk a little bit about what we are doing, but in detail I will talk about our learnings of building a product, which is live already, built on a utility token. Which means we did an ICO in end of 2017. We created the first um, cryptocurrency of Austria. And we now using this cryptocurrency to um, yeah, to build our product around it. And our goal is not, as I said, sustainability. Our goal is to change the game, to make betting, online betting, more transparent, um, more fair for the user, secure for the user. And yeah, that's, that's the long lasting goals we have for our company. So first of all, what are we doing? Um, I don't know if any, everyone here knows about eSports, what eSports is. Um, short description, eSports is professional computer gaming, which means uh, there are different games. The biggest ones are Dota, League of Legends. May some of you know Counter-Strike, which is around for about, I think, more than 20 years already. Um, and they have leagues, they have world championships, they have European championships and so on. So like traditional sports, um, also eSports works quite similar to it. And everywhere where some competitive things happen, you can bet on it, you know? So also betting in eSports is quite common already, it's growing, and that's currently our focus for our prototype for Herosphere.gg, that's our product, you can look it up, it's already live. And it's using or leveraging the power of, of blockchain and the power of our token. So users can bet on esports with our token, that's what we are doing. And during the last few years, just last two years, we come up with a lot of challenges and I want to present the challenges we had and how we solved it and that's just a quick look about what is Heroes VHG looking right now on the left side you can see a list of contests so this is a real game Chiefs vs ORD this is a real Counter-Strike game which happens I think in a few hours and you can join this contest uh, with a buy-in. So you stake a um, thousand or two thousand hero coin and then you are a participant of this contest. And this is a double up contest so you can win two thousand hero coin if you are in the um, best fifty percent of all the participants. And what you are doing within the contest is um, these are the two games here, uh, the two teams, sorry and you choose two or three, it depends on the mode of the contest, players where you think that they are performing the best way. So for example, you can choose Lost and Sven if you think that these two guys will play the best way within this game. So do the most kills, 
have the least deaths, do the most assists, and for every action you collect points. And you also predict the outcome, like in a traditional prediction game, betting game, um, you just say, for example, here, um, boom will win 2-2-0, two, two, for example. And for all these things, you will collect points, and in the end, we will have a ranking for all the participants. And if you're among the best 50%, then you double up your stake. You can see the ranking at the end. I was second here, so I have won 2,000 play here. That's how it is looking right now. And I will show you now the challenges we had. So I don't want to go in detail of our product. I want to show you what are the challenges if you want to build a product around a utility token. And there are a lot of challenges. I just picked these four challenges here. There are also, there's also the challenge for legal requirements like KYC, know your customer which is a big challenge in this area. There's also a challenge, of course, um, of the price, the ups and downs of, of the coin. You do not have the full control over it. Every one of us knows it. There is a market out there. There is a demand, a supply. And there are users which do not act like you want them to act most of the time. So you can't really control the market. We saw it last year, we had a lot of good news and the price was going down of our token, for example. And then we, I think we posted no, no use for news for around a month and suddenly the price got up. So no one knows why, but that's the market, you know? Good, let's come to these challenges we had. First of all, security. Security is, of course, a big issue in, in the blockchain space because you have to handle private keys, um, you have to handle the wallets of the users somehow, and I will show you one uh, solution we have for that. Then usability, of course. We want to be an eSports product, a betting product. We don't want to focus that much on a blockchain product because we want to have a broader user um, user base and we want to um, have a product where users can come to it, register and just play without knowing something about the blockchain space. This was the main goal, you know. But still we want to leverage the advantages of blockchain so we had to cope with, this, with these challenges. But usability is maybe the most important thing in our product. Then, of course, you need to look about the economics because if you have a utility token, somehow it should make sense that you use the token in your product. You know, you, you should be able to do something with, with this utility token. There were a lot of ICOs in last year and the year before um, where we saw projects which had a white paper but there was no sense for a utility token or no sense for a token at all or blockchain technology at all in the white paper. And that's what I meant with economics. It should make sense to have blockchain technology and a blockchain token in your product. You should do something with it. And I will show you what we are doing with it. And scalability. Every one of you who um, worked with blockchain already, who made some transactions already, may faced the problem with transactions, transaction costs, um, the time a transaction take to be mined. That's all scalability issues and I will show you the problems we had and how we tried to solve it at least. First of all, um, security challenge. And one challenge in this space was um, what we wanted our users to do is they should have a wallet in our product and they should be able to buy into a contest, which I showed you before, with this wallet. So they want to transfer money from their wallet into the contest, which is a smart contract. And then if they win, the tokens should be transferred back to their wallet again. The problem now is um, 
what we wanted to do is we, we do not want to have the control over their wallets, you know? We do not want to have the control over their private keys. Because the problem then is, if we just save the private keys and someone hacks our database, can always happen, then the attacker would have all the private keys and can take all the tokens and our product is dead because no one will ever come again to our product. So this, is, this was a big issue for us. What we did to solve this was um, we used a so-called salt and use a password approach, which means um, we create a cryptographical secure salt, which is just, um, you can imagine it like some characters, let's say 60 characters, completely random characters. And it's, it's created by our system, you know, but completely random. And we store this salt into our database. Then we tell the user, please create your wallet. And for your wallet, you need a secure password. And this password should be really secure and only you should know it, of course. And then in the browser, within the browser of the user, the salt is combined with the password and then some algorithmic functions around it. And together, these two strings create the private key. So we will never know the private key because we do not know the user password and this user password is never transferred over the internet. But we know the salt. And as long as the user knows his password, we can always recreate, or he at least can always recreate the private key. Another effect of this is, if we have an attacker for our database, he only can get, obtain the salt. And with the salt, he can do nothing. He can then try to brute force attack it maybe, but it takes a lot of resources and you can never be sure. So there's at least not an easy way to get the private key, even if I have the salt, you know? So this is the approach right now. I know there are a lot of other approaches already around, but this is the way we we went. Yeah, one thing which I did not say is um, the downside of it is we can never restore user passwords. And we have, of course, already users which told us, hey, I've lost my password and I want to access my wallet. What should I do now? And we say we cannot do anything because we do not have your private key. It's again, um, it's a thin line between security and usability, but that's the deal right now. We cannot restore any wallet passwords. You need to remember it. Like you need to remember or save your private key for an Ethereum wallet somewhere. Okay. Next challenge, the usability challenge. And that's something where I picked the contest buy-in. So as I said, we have a contest, and the user can join this contest if he wants to participate in the contest. And therefore, he needs to buy in. So he needs to transfer hero coins into the smart contract. I don't know, I guess not everyone in here would know how to do that, how to send a token from your wallet to a smart contract. And that's the key thing again, usability because most of our users do not know how to do that. And we, um, come up with, we came up with two different approaches which would be possible. The first thing is the user pays the transaction costs and makes the transaction on his own. But as I said, not everyone knows how to do that. Not everyone knows how to use MetaMask like we saw before. Not everyone has MetaMask or heard about it. And additionally, the user would need to have EFA already. And that's also not the case for most of our users. They do not have EFA, you know? So the first solution was not the way to go for us. Second solution, there's a concept in Ethereum which is called allowance or approval. And the thing here is that 
with one transaction, only one transaction, the user can give us the approval, the right to take funds from his wallet and put it into a contest. And that's what we want to do if we want to buy in um, a user into a contest. So the only thing the user needs to do is to click on buy in and now we have the right to take funds but only the buy-in amount, of course, and put it into the contest contract. And the user don't need to do anything. How this works is um, the first transaction, which the user needs to do, is a simple transaction which we create, a simple approval transaction. And what we needed to do is we needed to send him a little amount of ether to his wallet, because the user does not have any ether. Then the user approves the uh, allowance transaction because now he has a little bit of ether and with this ether he can pay the transaction cost for this first approval transaction. And after that what he does, what he does with this approval transaction is that he approves a second address which is in our control to put or to take hero coins from his wallet and put it into a contest. And from now on, we can take the transaction costs because the second address makes the transaction from this point. And that's the way how it, wor it works right now. User says he wants to join a contest. We tell this one address, please buy in this user into this contract and we pay the transaction costs. It's economical, economically hard for us because you know you lose money, you need to pay the transaction cost for every buy-in. But in contrast to that, the usability would be so much worse if we wouldn't do that, that we decided to do it at least for now. That's how it works right now. Um, a user has a wallet and he approved this controller here that this controller is allowed to take hero coins and put it in one of the contests. Okay? <coughs> the controller contract is only allowed to put it into a contest smart contract. This is hard coded here in the, in the controller smart contract. So he cannot send it to my wallet, for example. It's not possible. And the controller smart contract, um, as I said, put or makes the buy-in. And the contest smart contract pays out the winner again. So the contest smart contract knows who has won and then automatically pays the winners back. That's how it works. Pretty simple here, but in fact, in the background, it's quite complicated already. But if you know, for example, in, in the front end, every user can see the contest smart contract address. And with that, I can go on Etherscan, for example, put the, the address in, and I can see all the addresses which participated already in the contest, which made a buy-in. I can validate if the buy-ins are really there, if I have bought in, um, and when the contest smart contract paid the winners, I can also validate if all winners are paid, um, if there is something left in the contest smart contract or anything like that. <coughs> so there is no way how we could manipulate the whole betting uh, structure or betting system because you always can look at it. We could not make, for example, um, bot users which never have, um, have made a buy-in but get a payout. That's not possible because the contest smart contract would deny such a payout. He wouldn't do it because he would see that the winner had never done a buy-in, so he would not pay it out. That's how it works. Then the economics challenge. Um, as I said, the product needs to build some kind of microeconomic for the utility token. So what we try to do is to through the product to generate more demand than supply on a on exchange. And how we do it is, of course, if you think about it, um, 
if we as a company grow and have more and more users, then more and more users want to bet. In order to be able to bet, they need to buy hero coins. If they buy hero coins, that's how our exchange work. If a lot of you have a lot of buys on an exchange, your price will raise. And this is what the economic is behind Herosphere and Herocoin. The more users we have, the more bets we have, the higher the price will get, or at least it will become more stable. You know. Um, currently, we work with those guys here, uh, Trevor, uh, to build up a system where um, every purchase of play within our product, so users can purchase play on on Herosphere, is directly connected to the exchange. And um, you need to be very careful here that you be as live as possible because otherwise you will have some arbitrage possibilities here and that's not what we wanted to have because yeah, then we get scammed. And we were already scammed a lot through such, such things. So we had a lot of learnings uh, in this point. So that's how economic works. I hope you get it. It's quite simple if you look at it. You only need purchases. And in the best case, you have more purchases than sales on the exchange. Because not every um, winner will sell his win immediately on the exchange. So there will be a price raise, then a little down again, raise it down again, and so on. That's the economic behind it. And if you don't use your utility token in your product, then you do not have any economic in, in your product and in your system. And that's what a lot of white papers promised or outlined, that the token is just for funding. Uh, that's why a lot of ICOs just never had a product out there, because they did not know what they need to do with the utility token. Last challenge which I want to outline is scalability. Every one of you who knows Ethereum knows the limits of Ethereum. Uh, they work on it, we know it, but all the updates are delayed and delayed and delayed again. Um, the biggest challenge are the gas costs for us. Because um, we have certain transactions like the buy-in, the payout, the contest creation, for example, because the contest is also a smart contract. It needs to be created. And this is also just a transaction. Um, and this costs gas. And through the gas costs, through a gas price, I can control how fast the transaction is. You know? The more I am willing to pay for it, the faster it will be. But as I said before, we want to make business, so I can't I tell the transaction, take as much as you want, but I want you to be finished in a few seconds. That's not possible. And the problem right now is we know the gas costs, but the gas cost change it, changes. And it changes immediately often. Sometimes it jumps. Gas costs are measured in Y and if you or the gas price. And if you for example currently most of the time it's good to have five Y for a transaction, it's fine. It will go through in a few minutes. That's okay for us. But then you have times um, yesterday afternoon, something like that, the safe low of Y was 22. And suddenly you have costs um, not only 40 cents for a transaction anymore, but four dollars to bring the transaction through the blockchain. And that's the problem because we cannot wait we cannot wait hours for a transaction to go through because the user wants to have his money if he wins, right? Or he wants to participate in a contest immediately. So that's the problem behind the scalability for us. And the contest payouts are the biggest problem, the biggest challenge, because if the buy-in takes a little bit, it doesn't matter. But if a user wins, he wants to have his payout immediately. That's the problem, and he wants to see it on his wallet. And yeah, what we are doing is we try with, we, we take the safe low, the current safe low, let's say 5Y, 
we try to broadcast this transaction, the payout, and then we monitor the transaction. And if it takes more than 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I don't know what it is right now, we try to overwrite the transaction again with more guai because it takes already too long. And this circle is done all the time until we reach the payout, which means the, we try it with six guai and seven guai, 10 minutes later with eight guai and so on. I mean, we have a limit, but it already happened that um, we paid or the transaction costs were higher than the win the user got. You know, this, this does not make any sense economically. It doesn't make sense to do that. But it makes sense for the user because he wants to have the win. So we have to do it right now. Our hope is that Ethereum will get a little bit better and some of the future updates prove or we hope that they will prove that Ethereum can scale, we will see. Um, but yeah, that's the challenge right now we have. The only possibility we have is to overwrite transactions, which take, take too long. And I think this challenge will be in every utility token or nearly every, every blockchain product where front-end users want to work with it. We will have it everywhere. In every program. One thing I want to say at the end here is I know there are other concepts around already to um, solve these problems and every two weeks there come new concepts but as you know we are a startup we can't throw away all our code every two weeks we do it now and then <laughs> but yeah that's our that were our challenges and our solutions for now if you have any questions to that, please ask me. I know a lot of stuff about all these things. And if I do not know the answer, I have a great fantasy, so I can imagine something. <laughs> Let's do one Thanks. question, right? I <laughs> a little bit over time. Are Sorry. We? No, no, no problem. Yeah, but hit this, yeah. It's, it is in our interest, and that's also why we built into a token, into the token we built something which is called general reward, which means um, from every contest which is played, there is a pot in the contest. You know, if the buy-in is 1,000 and you have 10 participants, then the pot is 10,000. And our token ensures that 1% of this pot is taken away and is then distributed to every token holder. So in fact, you are rewarded if you hold token just for yeah, holding purpose. But honestly, my goal is that the token is used. I don't want to be an asset which should just be held because there are better ones. There is Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all the other, the big ones. Do holding with them. Play with our token. That's, that's our goal. <laughs> yeah? Um, <laughs> there are a lot of answers to that question because, first of all, if you have a B2C product like we have, then marketing, you need a lot of budget for marketing, you know? There, you can use millions within days if you like. Um, so this is the first thing. We are trying to, currently we try to prove our marketing concepts with small amounts, small budget, and then we will scale it. But that's the current phase. That's the first thing. The second thing is um, we set the system up in a way that the scalability issues are not so big issues for us. Why? Because the buy-in 
is not time critical. You can buy in be or you, sh you need to buy in before the game starts. The game takes between a half an hour and one and a half hour, depending on the mode and the game. So there is a time frame where the buy-in transaction needs to go through. And this time frame is pretty long, like 30 minutes to one hour. That's not a problem. Contest payout is a usability issue, but still, if the user gets his winning 30 minutes later, it's not that big an of an issue. Um, but you're right, we are not so big in scaling right now. We try to make this economics work right now. So what we want to do is to close the system with the connection to the exchange, what we are doing right now with those guys. And then we try to test it with the few hundred users which are using the system right now. If this is working, if there is no arbitrage possibility, if there is no way of scanning us, then we can scale. If you do it before, then you have no control over it anymore and you will lose a lot of money. That's the main reason for it. You need the shop, which we deployed a few weeks ago. Um, this was, it, it's not a plan for us to go in e-commerce with our token. It was just a functionality um, that users, which do not know the functionality behind exchanges, can also do something with their winnings. Because if you think about it, they pay money, they get our token, they play with it, maybe they win something, but what to do with those tokens right now? They do not know that they can exchange it to Ether and then the Bitcoin and to money again. But now they have the possibility to buy PASIF cards or Steam cards or anything like that. That was the main thought behind it. Yeah. I may uh, ask another question. Yeah. Have you ever considered uh, a side chain? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you're, 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 you're talking long and long about this one, and I, I already see the solution, so we, we, we just presented one, but uh, you could use XDAI, you could use POA, uh, yeah. all of those chains, you can move assets from Ethereum there, yeah. and you can move them around there and you can easily move them back and you can even exchange it automatically on Uniswap. Yeah. So basically, in my opinion, that's a, a fairly simple yeah. thing right to now, solve. Right now, that's true. But if you think back to, we launched the product and this system with the contest smart contracts um, in the third quarter of 2018. That's where all the medium posts about side chains came up. And it's not that long ago, you know? And it we tried. Long, right? It feels long, yeah. <laughs> but only a few months. And that's what I said at the end. We cannot throw away our system all the time. So, side chains are definitely a project for end of 2019 or beginning of 2020. Um, but in fact, that does not really matter because if we can make the economics with this approach right now, side chain is only an improvement, an economic improvement for sure. us, and maybe a usability improvement, of course. I mean, they are faster and you, they are not, exactly. not as faster, cool as cheaper, Ethereum. Cheaper, and cheaper for us. Yeah. So if we can make money right now, then we can make more money with a side chain. Sure. <laughs> and that's, that's the fault behind it right now. Yeah. Are you, Um, currently, we have a data a simple data provider for it, um, which over a normal, not a blockchain API, tells us the results. Um, but we are thinking about in, in the future, and it's also described in our white paper. We want to have, which is called an oracle, on a blockchain, and we are currently in talks with our data provider if he can connect with this oracle and brings the esports data on the blockchain. This will be the first step, you know? And the second step would be some kind of voting system, which is also known by Augur, for example, um, where we can provide the result, 
and then users have a time frame of a few minutes to vote for it or vote against it. Maybe they get rewarded for it. And then you have, again, some kind of a decentralized manner of, of data, of esports data. But this is the future, you know. That's a little bit away from now. Are you going to stay with esports? Or go also, are you going to offer peer-to-peer -peer soccer betting? Yeah. Um, actually, we came from soccer. We started our startup with soccer and then tried tennis, Formula One, skiing, ski jumping. Um, and then on the blockchain stuff came up. But um, esports was really one thing which worked for us. And where we saw that we have a young team and we can address the esports guys. We, I think I can say that we understand them and we know how to get them. And it's a big market, but there are not so many players on the market. So it's easy for a startup in esports to get users. If you try it in soccer, you have all <laughs> companies in the world try to make marketing in soccer. Think about your local soccer team. You have a hundred sponsors there from the restaurant nearby you to, I don't know, any telecom company. So everyone tries to make marketing and get users from the soccer space. That's why in the end we had the approach for eSports. We are a startup, we need to focus. Yeah, I totally understand that, it's just in future. And in the future, currently we have no plans to make soccer again or any other. We really want to focus on eSports, but um, the goal is, and we are in talks with different betting companies, with the big players, which every one of you know. Um, and we want to bring them to a point where they use our token for their system. So that's the talks we have right now. What I can say is that they are all thinking about it. They all know that blockchain is very interesting in the betting space, but they want to see some kind of proof of concept that it really works, you know? They do not want to um, bring resources in before they do not see that it works somehow. And that's exactly what we are doing right now with Herosphere. We want to have a proof of concept where we can tell all the big betting providers it can work with our token, you can make money with our token, users do use it, it's not so complicated like it may seem at the beginning. Um, yeah, and that's our focus for Herosphere. Sounds like an exit to Bibin Party. <laughs> you never know. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, next one, De Facturo, a very different space to work in. <laughs> So we talk about the invoices, uh, what a hero sphere is, is maybe issuing quite frequently. Yeah. So now we are changing also the ecosystem. So the guys they're working more on Hyperledger and less on, on Ethereum. Uh, but <laughs> So, Rainer, thank you. So, I'm going to start with a couple of bad news for you. We don't use any token. Second is, we don't use Ethereum. And I want to talk about business case, and this is not a pure technical presentation. So, I'm the managing director of Defecturo. So, as the name says, digital invoices. So, our business case is the digital transformation and the problem is that every business you are in in the end of the day you have to send an invoice if not you get no money you get bankrupt so if we go a step back it's complete easy send paper invoices across the world receiving invoices from China sending to Agenjina it's wrecking Paper is really a nice thing, it's really working nice. But if you're going sending electronic invoices, there are coming up a lot of problems to you with different formats, 
different laws from different countries and it's more worse and worse. So I get out some numbers from a security report from the KPMG. So as we see that the uh, valuated tax carousel, the EU lose a lot of billions of euros each year with tax fraud and manipulation. And also the biggest companies spend 100 million to a fraudster from manipulating emails. And at what we see is desk risk is rising very fast. Also the problem is that spying, you're losing data, stealing data, and also account manipulation data, financial data. What we tried is to bring up a system that you cannot manipulate something of this. So what we do is, we're building up an infrastructure to securely send invoices from A to B. In the end, we build up an archive in the cloud. Uh, compare paper invoices to electronic invoices. So if you send a paper invoice, it's very costly. So approximately 1.77 euro for one paper document to send to snail mail. And we charging 50 cent for each electronic invoices. Start 10 years in our system to fulfill the legal requirements of the company. I will go step back. Uh, starting on the right side, the central approach. Uh, exchanging electronic invoices is 35 years old. Electronic data interchange, typical APA communication, so system to system. The problem is on this side, if you have, for a big company, 1,000 suppliers, you have to build up 1,000 interfaces, 1,000 projects, you have to monitor 1,000 APIs and so on. So the next step is that the companies are going to a network model. So an infra service provider provides you one interface. You connect to this one service provider and the service provider is doing all the monitoring of the interfaces on the onboarding in this case. The problem on this network approach is if you receive a, is also an, uh, a contract with an infra service provider, you have to need that your service provider have a contract with the service provider of the receiver that you can exchange invoices. And you have paid plus 35 cents. So you pay 50 cents to your service provider plus 35 cents for the second service provider that the invoice is going maybe uh, cross border. And as you know, the best fitting solution is a decentralized system. So I'm not talking about the blockchain. So we have a decentralized system. We are using Hyperledger from the Linux Foundation. It's not really a blockchain. And what we see on the left side, the, the EDI market covers the biggest companies. So typically in the, in the car industry, a manufacturer to manufacturer, they have one interface is working very well. So they cover covers uh, approximately 80% of the market. But what we do is we can support all company sizes. So we have one interface, one backbone. It's usable for a single person company, for mid size and also for enterprise. And we can do the same with a private person. So we bring a cloud system to everyone with our solution. How we do this? We prefer a format, a PDF format with an XML. So in Germany, it's called a Zugwert, Central User Guides for Electronic uh, Invoices Germany. It's a PDF E3 data container plus an XML. So we store this document in our cloud and the receiver side can easily read the XML part. How it works? A creates an invoice 
and maybe there's a small company they're creating with Microsoft Word invoices. So we have tools, a virtual printer driver to support the supplier. So it's very easily to format the form, the date in yellow, the amount in green, the event in blue, so on and so on. And out of this color code, we are creating the XML. The printer driver creates the PDA phase three, and we do a merge from the XML and the PDF and the printer driver writes into our system for the API. And on this side, the document is encrypted uh, symmetrically with an AES key. So we write in the transaction that A sent to B an invoice with a timestamp, with the hash value of the document, plus a link to the document and the AES key. So each document is encrypted with a different AES key. With the result, this B can immediately access to his transaction, decrypt the transaction, and get the data and put it in, the, in his accounting system. What we also do is, we can write more than two participants for the process in the transaction. So, maybe I have outsourced my bookkeeping, I have an invoice, outgoing invoice, it's immediately encrypted also for my tax advisor for the bookkeeping, or if the government forces A to encrypt for the government, the government can do tax calculation in real time with our open source software. And a special thing is that we create a non-traceable blockchain. So we do not write sender and receiver in one transaction, we write uh, sender transaction and the receiver transaction and you can only see your own transaction and decrypt your own transactions. This is our tool, so we are using Hyperledger Fabric, we are using Sovereign for the identity management, we are producing software business connectors for the ERP systems like SAP, but also the other ERP systems. We have contracts with Microsoft, uh, uh, Thatch and BMD. What we're doing is we bring in an invoice ledger also to small companies. So big companies are, are used to use an invoice ledger that they know what invoices are in the, in the company to make the liquidity for the next couple of weeks. We bring this in our web interface and also for our apps. We have an interface to e-business, so web shops. So as I said, if you buy something in the web shop, in the end you need an invoice. So we're giving it our uh, libraries for free. And in this case, we're giving it our interface free for the cash register manufacturers. So that's in the end, if you're going to the point of sales, you pay something. The terminal sends the sovereign DAT to the cash register software and the cash register software sends back the receipt with the sovereign DAT back to our interface so it's going to the mobile of our customer. This is a slide for the problems you have if you are a bigger company and maybe you have a lot of customers around the world so you have to support different formats for each company that you can send correct invoices, electronic invoices for each company. Our traction, we have a big search program from uh, received from Google, uh, 100K for cloud. Uh, we have a seal from the European Commission. Our use case partners, Payment Service Austria for the banking stuff, and one of our biggest customers. So our nodes are run actually in data centers. So we have data center A1 Digital, Raiffeisen Rechenzentrum, Citicom Graz, CLP Software is a partner in Munich, Infomines is a partner in Italy, Dotson. Then we also support in, uh, the public clouds like uh, Google and Azure. Yes, that's it. This is my team. And that's our go to market strategy. So we have a big appointment about 
Italy, so Italy it's already now forced that each company sends the invoice to the government on a portal and the system is not a very secure system but it's uh, running and we built an, an proxy that the Italian, cust Italian customers can dis send the invoices via our system to the interface from the Italy financial government. Thank you. Many questions. questions. What made you choose Hyperledger instead of other solutions? Uh, we are SAP consultants coming from the enterprise and okay. we know that it's easier to handle with a framework that's supported for the big companies. So Hyperledger is supported from SAP, Accenture and all the big companies. So it's very easy going to a data center saying you have a solution, it's this framework and you're going in compared to our own solution with our own protocol. So an example, uh, I'm working for, for OMV. If you're going there and you bring your own software, you can put the source code to these guys, they look on the source code half a year, and then maybe you're going into the data center. That's the reason. Any more questions? Okay. Well so if not, we can stay back and talk about it. Yeah. So let's look for the last presentation. Thank you very much, Raina. Thank you. to devices where we create it. <laughs> Ja, hallo, einen wunderschönen Abend. Ihr habt das eh gehört. Bei mir wird Deutsch gesprochen. Wie wurde ja gesagt, heute ist eben ein deutscher Vortrag, deswegen bin heute ich da. Normalerweise international haben wir natürlich unseren Business Developer und noch andere Leute, die da einen Vortrag haben. Mein Name ist Alexander Kretschmer, ich bin Co-Founder von Salamantex und Head of Sales und ich werde euch jetzt kurz ein bisschen über Salamantex, die Hintergründe, wie sind wir überhaupt entstanden. Kennst du den? Okay. Äh, ja, der René Pumasel war Leiter eines internationalen Börsenclubs, steht eh recht so. Und so haben wir auch kennengelernt. 2016 haben wir die Idee kreiert, einen eigenen Coin zu machen, um beim Börsenclub eben mit unseren eigenen Coin auch zu bezahlen. Dann haben wir geschaut, dass man, ich glaube, 420 gelistete Coins auf CoinMarketCap haben und gesagt, wer braucht denn bitte nur einen neuen Coin bei über 400 gelisteten Coins? Dann haben wir das wieder verworfen und haben gesagt, okay, aber was braucht die Krypto-Community wirklich? Dass man überall damit bezahlen kann und das alles natürlich leicht zu handhaben ist. Also nur so kann ich auch die Massenadoption noch vorantreiben und nicht nur, äh, ich sag mal, die Krypto- versierten Leute damit erreichen, sondern ja, die Masse und die brauchen wir. Der René Brumasel ist eben IT-Spezialist, hat schon einige Projekte äh, realisiert, auch mit den Mitgründern von Salamantex, haben schon mittlerweile schon über 18 Jahre Erfahrung 
in verschiedenen Projekten, viele natürlich in äh, ja, automatisierten Programmen für die Börse, weil dem IT-Techniker gelernt und ist dem dann durch den Börsenclub hat das, hat, äh, eine professionelle Börsenausbildung gemacht, eine Trading-Ausbildung. Wie gesagt, war auch, bevor er dann CEO von Salamantix geworden ist, auch der Leiter dieses Clubs mit über 6000 Mitgliedern und beschäftigt sich selber schon seit 2011 mit Blockchain und hat, so wie viele andere, ich leider nicht, mit seinem Rechner zu Hause Bitcoin gemeint. Das Team ist mittlerweile schon angewachsen und jetzt sind wir schon eigentlich über 25 Mitgliedern. Angefangen haben wir in einem Vierkanthof, der war schon ein bisschen baufällig war und jetzt sind wir umgezogen. Es gibt ja ein paar Leute, die haben uns schon besucht in unserem Büro äh, im Tulnerfelder Bahnhof, weil mit über 20 Leuten muss man natürlich mal in andere Büros auch. Digitale Währungen sind auf dem Vormarsch. 9% der Europäer besitzen bereits Kryptowährungen, 25% äh, glauben in Zukunft eben Kryptowährungen zu besitzen und 23 Prozent glauben, dass sie mit ihnen auch bezahlen werden. 35 Prozent glauben an die äh, zukünftige Kryptowährung beim Online-Payment. Ich kann euch gerade den Link geben, also das haben wir uns nicht ausgedacht, sondern es gibt da einen Link dazu. Und 79 Prozent der Österreicher haben schon was von Kryptowährungen gehört. Das große Problem war für die Unternehmer, weil wir haben viele Unternehmer gefragt, warum nehmt ihr eigentlich keine Kryptowährungen? Das, was eigentlich immer als erste genannt wurde, ja das Risiko. Ich muss Miete zahlen, ich muss meine Leute zahlen, ich muss die Produkte zahlen. Und wenn ich da jetzt was äh, mit Kryptowährung, also eine Krypto akzeptiere, Bitcoin, und der fällt dann innerhalb von einer Stunde, dann habe ich einen Verlust gemacht. Das Risiko kann ich nicht eingehen. Nächstes Thema, es ist viel zu kompliziert und wie mache ich das rechtlich und wie schaut es mit der Buchhaltung aus? Weil ich war seit 2017, ich war glaube ich bei sieben äh, Steuerberater, äh, damit mir die helfen bei der Versteuerung von Kryptowährungen. Einer hat mich sogar aus seinem Büro rausgeschmissen. Er hat gesagt, ihr seid Verbrecher, Kryptowährungen, geh weg. Und deswegen, das hat die, die Masse, sage ich mal, die Unternehmer abgeschreckt. Äh, weil sie nicht gewusst haben, wie sie uns damit hantieren. Deswegen haben wir uns zum Ziel gesetzt, dass wir das eben vereinfachen. Wie gesagt, vereinfache die Annahme von Kryptowährungen. Und äh, ein Credo von uns war immer easy to use. Es muss leicht zu handhaben sein. Ich weiß selber, wie ich damit angefangen habe mit Kryptowährungen. Ich habe mein Ether Wallet gemacht. Das war ein Wahnsinn für mich. Also, da ist weit weg von Easy to Use für mich. Und wichtiger integrierte Sicherheitsfunktionen. Bei unser Terminal, wenn man damit bezahlt, der Unternehmer muss ja auch geschützt werden. Es gibt eine Möglichkeit, weil der Unternehmer, auch viele von unseren Unternehmern, die kennen sich nicht aus mit Kryptowährungen. Sie wissen zwar den Vorteil, okay, es gibt dort draußen Kryptowährungen, wie wir schon gehört haben, 79 Prozent der Österreicher kennen Kryptowährungen und wissen, was das ist, aber die Handhabung. Und deswegen eine Sicherheitsfunktion, wenn der Kunde zu wenig bezahlen würde mit Kryptowährungen, weil beim Geld, da weiß ich, dass es ist. Aber bei Kryptowährungen nicht, da schaue ich auch nicht auf sein Wallet, hey, hast du mir das wirklich geschickt? Oder wenn er auch zu viel bezahlen würde, dann gibt es auch eben eine Sicherheitsfunktion, Achtung, äh, der Kunde hat eben zu wenig bezahlt und dann ist, wird der Unternehmer gleich darauf hingewiesen. Einfache Integrierung in verschiedene Kassensystemen. Man kann unser, unser System nicht nur auf unserem Terminal nützen. Sondern auch auf jedem Endgerät. Also auf dem Laptop, auf dem Handy, Tablet, ganz egal, kann ich das überall benutzen. Ein wichtiger Punkt war eben die Steuern. Wie mache ich das mit den Steuern? Wenn ich kaufe eine Kryptowährung, dann steigt es, dann verkaufe ich es, dann muss ich das auch noch versteuern und und und. Viel zu kompliziert für die Leute. Uns gibt eine detaillierte äh, Auflistung, wie man es eben kennt, von Visa und Mastercard-Terminals. Einmal im Monat oder einmal in der Woche, eben 
seine Abrechnung. Er kann auch jederzeit in seine Abrechnung, also in das Backoffice, eben reingehen, sieht jede Abrechnung und kann es natürlich täglich an, an Tagesbericht natürlich auch ausdrucken. Und das Wichtigste, er hat gleich einen Exchange in Fiat, also in Euro oder je nachdem in welchem Land das wir eben sind, damit der Unternehmer kein Kursrisiko eben hat. Das sieht man jetzt die Oberflächen eben auf einem Telefon. Der Unternehmer gibt ein 43,13 Euro oder es wird ihm von seinem Kassensystem eben gleich äh, rübergeschickt. Er drückt auf Confirm, ja, der Betrag ist okay. Im nächsten Step sucht er sich eine Kryptowährung aus. Also da, er fragt den, äh, den Kunden, welche, mit welcher Kryptowährung das er bezahlen möchte. In dem Moment, wenn er sich für wie in diesem Fall für Bitcoin entschieden hat, wird gleich der Umrechnungskurs von der Börse geholt, für diesen Augenblick, und äh, wird für 35 Sekunden eben fixiert. Das Sicherheit, es kann ja sein, dass er der Endkunde noch irgendwas fragen will über das Produkt, ganz egal. Wenn die Zeit abläuft, holt er sich automatisch den neuen aktuellen Kurs wieder von der Börse, oder wenn er sagt, ah, ich habe gestern schon mit Bitcoin gezahlt, aber Litecoin, Litecoin hätte ich noch über und drückt einfach auf Litecoin, holt den aktuellen Kurs und kann damit bezahlen. Dann wird der QR-Code generiert. Der Kunde kann den abscannen. Wir werden das nachher noch in unserem Terminal sehen. Wir können das durchgeben. Und dann gibt es eine Bestätigung. Und der die Zahlung ist abgeschlossen, zwei Häkchen heißt alles okay, der Kunde hat den richtigen Betrag bezahlt, der Unternehmer kann ihm das Produkt oder die Ware, je nachdem, egal die Dienstleistung, eben ausliefern. Und das Wichtigste, es wird für den Unternehmer gleich Exchange, er bekommt äh, auf sein Konto die Euros überwiesen und kann sich natürlich den, die Auflistung ausdrucken bzw. bekommt das einmal im Monat von uns per E-Mail geschickt. Sind wir es wieder easy to use, integrierte Sicherheitsfunktionen, eine davon habe ich vorhin schon erwähnt. Natürlich haben wir auch API-Schnittstellen für Web-Plugins. Und was auf das wir sehr viel Wert legen, was uns sowieso jetzt äh, auf 10. Jänner 2020 jeden sowieso betrifft, der mit Kryptowährungen zu tun hat uns natürlich besonders im Payment-Bereich. Wir schauen immer in jedem Land, welche Regelungen hat dieses Land. Äh, können wir da schon arbeiten? Was müssen wir machen? Brauchen wir wie, wie in Deutschland die Lizenz äh, und natürlich eine, eine Banklizenz und die Genehmigung? Genauso <lacht> wird es auch nächstes Jahr bei uns auch sein mit der Genehmigung von der BaFin, äh, von der FMA. Und wir machen jetzt schon, also bevor wir das bewusst haben, weil wir uns immer für die Zukunft eben rüsten, wir machen von jedem Händler einen KYC-Prozess, weil es ab jetzt, also bald so, 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 äh, so sein muss. Einfache Integrierung mit äh, Kassensystemen. Wir arbeiten eben schon mit verschiedenen Kassensystemen zusammen, dass man die Integrierung eben so leicht wie möglich macht, weil der Kunde da draußen ist immer ich will nicht mehr Arbeit haben, ich möchte es so leicht wie möglich haben. Das ist der Unternehmer da draußen, ich möchte nicht, dass meine Leute viel Zeit damit verbringen, dass sie das Gerät bedienen oder sonst irgendwas. Deswegen das Gerät easy to use und auch natürlich in den Kassensystem. Monatliche Auszahlung geht auch wöchentlich eben per E-Mail. Die Vorteile haben wir da für die, für die, Endkunden, also für die Unternehmer Neukundengewinnung. Das ist einfach ein, äh, ja, also viele von unseren Kunden in Bad Hall, der Apple Store, der hat schon einige neue Kunden gewonnen, auch viele Restaurants, weil sich die Krypto-Enthusiasten natürlich erstmal das mal anschauen wollen. Und, und zweitens, das bei uns, bei uns ist günstiger. Wenn sie mit äh, Krypto bei uns bezahlen, haben sie weniger Spesen, also wenn sie zum Automaten oder irgendwo gehen und sich die Euros holen. Und dann ist natürlich wieder egal, wenn sie die Euros in der Hand haben, ob sie dorthin gehen oder dorthin gehen. Aber wenn der Unternehmer das Terminal bei sich stehen hat, dann gehen die äh, Leute, was wir jetzt schon 
nach Erzählungen und Erfahrungen. Das erste war ja 2018, das war das ähm, Pancho in Wien und der war selber überrascht, wie viele Leute da schon gekommen sind und sich schon so kleine Stammtische gebildet haben von Krypto. Verliebten, sage ich jetzt mal, die was dort hingehen und dann auch natürlich bezahlen mit Krypto werden. Und jetzt geht es immer weiter. Ja, wohl auch eben 2018, das war da links eben beim Pancho. Und wir haben uns also überall in die Nachrichten auch gelesen, dass das Salamantex die Kryptobezahlung in den Einzelhandel bringt. Wir haben da verschiedene. Äh, eben da unten mit Dash, wir haben auch eine Kooperation mit Embassy, also mit Dash Embassy Dach. Äh, und das ist bis nach Amerika gegangen, über die Dash Community, weil jeder, jeder Coin hat ja seine eigene Community, äh, ist bis nach Amerika gegangen, da haben wir in Salzburg beim ADEC mit Dash sein Wurst einmal kaufen kann. Und das ist auch super, weil man die Macht ja der Community, das ist ungebrochen. Und natürlich ein, ich sag, schauen wir ja Meilenstein, die Partnerschaft mit A1. Also bis Ende dieses Monats kann man in ausgewählten, jetzt das erste Mal in ausgewählten Shops von A1 Handys, Covers, alles Mögliche mit Kryptowährung kaufen. Das ist schon Wahnsinn. Also nicht nur, man sieht auch hier, also A1 und Ingenico. Ingenico sagt das irgendjemanden. Also die ganzen Visa Mastercard Terminals gibt es verschiedene, aber einer der größten ist eben in Genico, die haben weltweit 22 Millionen Terminals und wir haben mit, nicht nur mit rein, sondern in Genico eine Partnerschaft. Wir programmieren gerade für diese Terminals unsere Software, dass in jedem Geschäft, wo in Genico Terminals stehen, eben unsere Software drauf implementiert werden kann und dann Kryptowährung akzeptieren kann ohne dass ich eben ein weiteres Gerät brauche. Ja, wir haben äh, auf unserer Seite sieht man natürlich die verschiedenen Akzeptanzstellen, nicht nur auf unserer Seite, das ist eben äh, ein Stück von unserer Kundenarbeit, dass man auf den sämtlichen Seiten äh, groß eben so Akzeptanzstellen zum Wissen gibt, wissen wir die da. Weil es ist ja äh, nicht nur wichtig, dass der Unternehmer jetzt die Akzeptanzstelle wird, sondern auch, dass die Community weiß, dass die Akzeptanzstelle da ist. Weil ihr habt es genau unter euch, nämlich eine Akzeptanzstelle. Von Salamantex, im Rocks, im Gras. Kennt ihr mit Kryptowährung bezahlen. So ein Zufall. Ich habe sehr gut aussieht. Das sieht man nur mal im Genico Group A1 und Soccercoin. Ich werde gleich noch darüber was erzählen mit dem Soccercoin ist der, der Gedanke oder es wird eigentlich schon umgesetzt, dass man in das Stadion eben mit dem Soccercoin eben bezahlen kann, Merchandising, äh, Eintrittskarten und vieles mehr, das alles über den Soccercoin. Genau, Jerry. Wie wir diese Terminals angefangen haben zum, zum Ausrollen, haben unsere Programmierer auch äh, ja, Stresstests gemacht mit verschiedenen Coins. Ich habe selber 2017 und ich glaube, ich bin nicht der Einzige, ich habe 10 Bitcoin verschickt. Ende 2017 waren 180.000 Dollar. Jetzt drei Tage lang habe ich gewartet, bis das auch kommen. Ich glaube, jeden Tag habe ich mehrmals reingeschaut. Ja, wo ist jetzt gerade? Und ich glaube, jeden hat es schon mal betroffen und jetzt auch wieder. Ich habe letztens einen Kunden von uns 10 Euro geschickt, Bitcoin und auf 1,15 Euro Spesen zahlt. 11 Prozent, das ist glaube ich nicht recht userfreundlich. Und aus diesem Grund und auch als, ich sage mal, als Beschützung für unser Netzwerk, für Salamantex, weil wir reden jetzt nicht von 100.000 oder weiß nicht, wie viele User haben wir, glaube ich im Dachraum 15 Millionen, wie, viel, wie viele Leute gibt es im Dachraum, ich glaube ein paar mehr. Und wenn man dann die Terminals da draußen stehen haben und die Leute wirklich das nützen, ich glaube, dann stehen wir sehr bald vor einem großen Problem. Und aus diesem Grund wurde das Cherry Netzwerk äh, gemacht. Oder ist man eigentlich was dabei auch? 
Äh, Jerry Network ist in erster Linie dafür da, eben dieses Netzwerk, das Salamantex Netzwerk, äh, zu sichern. Warum? Weil die, weil die Bezahlungen, egal ob sie jetzt Bitcoin sind oder andere Kryptowährungen, dann über dieses Netzwerk abgewickelt werden. In Form von äh, Atomic Swap. Des Weiteren wird dieses Netzwerk äh, Smart Contract fähig sein, aber alles immer über Salamantex. Noch ein wichtiger Punkt, das ist ein Kooperationspartner von uns. Die Perinomics. Und also es wird zwar von Salamantex programmiert, aber die Perinomics sitzt eben nicht in Österreich, sondern auf Malta. Es werden eben Smart Contracts fähig sein, aber alles easy to use. Für was brauchen wir die? Für automatisierte monatliche Bezahlungen zum Beispiel. Das ist ein Punkt. Warum Jerry, der Name, äh, sind es hier erstklassige Unterstützung für Charity Organisationen. Ein Teil von diesen äh, Transaktionen, Gebühren, sage ich jetzt einmal, werden äh, für Charity Organisationen zur Verfügung gestellt. Da wird was Eigenes aufgebaut wo sich die Leute mit dem Wallet dann bei der Bezahlung auch äh, bestätigen können, welche oder aussuchen können, welche Chair die Organisation sie unterstützen möchte. Ein weiterer Punkt und Kooperationen mit Banken mit EU-Vollbank-Lizenz. Ja, hier sind auch ein paar Partner von uns, die man sehen, Genico, Vicoro, Ergonomics, wo der Cherry eben äh, programmiert wird, herkommt. Soccercoin A1, E und S Group ist auf Malta eine der größten, bekanntesten äh, Rechtsanwaltskanzleien. Ja, das war es eigentlich von meiner Präsentation. Ich würde euch noch zwei Sachen zeigen, oder drei. Hier sieht man es auch, also es geht auf jedem gängigen Endgerät, ist es möglich, unsere Software Programmieren. Hier sieht man unser Terminal. Wie gesagt, ihr könnt es euch dann anschauen. Und weiters. Also das Terminal ist ja nicht nur für Kryptowährungsbezahlungen, sondern wir haben hier natürlich auch weiter gedacht. NFC, fähig, Kartenslot. Also wir sind dran, dass man normale herkömmliche Kreditkarten und äh, NFC-Karten eben auf unserem Terminal eben verwenden kann. Und weiters eben gerade Touristengebiete äh, vom asiatischen Raum, weil wir auch viel im asiatischen Raum tätig sind und jetzt bald auch äh, eine Firma aufmachen werden dort, ähm, digitale Bezahlung generell. Also Alipay, Widget Pay, alles aus einer Hand. Ist uns auch herangetragen worden von vielen unseren Kunden. Hey, ich brauche das noch drauf oder könnt ihr das noch machen? Und weiter sind wir gerade dabei, mit auch in einem anderen österreichischen Startup eine Kryptokarte zu entwickeln. Nicht nur für Kryptos, sondern für herkömmliche Karten wie Kreditkarten oder EC-Karten. Alles aus einer Hand und easy to use. Vielen Dank. Also wenn es irgendwelche Fragen gibt, wir sind nicht noch länger da. Meine Kollegen haben extra Verstärkung mitgenommen. Ja, ihr geht es gleich auch noch Fragen. Oder oder so, ihr braucht es nicht warten. Fragen noch? Das ist jetzt finster. Tausende da fahren wir aber für zurück. Ah. Ist es geplant, dass ihr auch Stablecoins unterstützt? Weil aktuell sehe ich da jetzt nicht wirklich was. Ja, wir haben einmal es war ein der Versuch auf Malta. Ein Stablecoin, äh, was ist möglich. Wir können grundlegend an jedem Coin da drauf geben, aber es muss natürlich passen von der Abwicklung. Er muss natürlich äh, ein gewisses Volumen aufweisen, weil es ist ja nichts anderes. Ihr bezahlt es mit Krypto, auf der anderen Seite muss er verkauft werden. Und wenn kein Volumen da ist, kann er nicht verkauft werden. Wir haben ja schon einige Anfragen gekriegt, eben damals von Dash unter anderem. Äh, aber bei Dash ist natürlich Volumen kein Problem. 
Mhm. Äh, aber wir kriegen natürlich laufende Anfragen. Mhm. Also generell, wenn ihr äh, ja, wenn ihr habt, jemanden habt, der einen Coiner oder sonst irgendwas und eben in den Bereich der Zahlung gehen möchte, einfach Anfrage schicken und dann können wir sich das gerne anschauen. Weiters ist es natürlich wichtig, die ganze äh, Crypto-Community äh, um eure Unterstützung natürlich auch zu beten. Wenn ihr jemanden habt, sagt, hey, mein Stammlokal, ich möchte, dass der Kryptos akzeptiert, meldet euch einfach bei uns, wir können sie mit dem zusammensitzen, erklären das Ganze und dann sieht man sich, ob er es nützen möchte oder nicht. Aber warum soll er es nicht nützen? Weil er kriegt eh seine Euros aufs Konto und hat kein Risiko. Ihr müsst natürlich dann einige haben bei zwei Nadeln. Das Terminal muss ich mieten wahrscheinlich als... Das Terminal, das kann man kaufen. Wie gesagt, es gibt die Variante, es haben schon viele Kassensysteme, haben ja eben ein Bildschirm, im Endeffekt am PC. Da kann man es drauf tun, da muss man das Terminal äh, nicht kaufen. Aber sonst ist es zum Kaufen oder auch zum Mieten. Ne? Ich Bestellung nehmt hier ein, wenn ich jetzt da zum Beispiel einen halben Bitcoin, 0,1 Bitcoin da irgendwo hinschicke. Also verkauft ihr das dann im Namen des Händlers auf der Börse oder sagt ihr nur dem Händler, macht einen Account bei Bitstamp nein, 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 nein. und wir ja. vermitteln die API dazwischen? Ja, äh, der Unternehmer hat mit dem Ganzen gar nichts zu tun, das heißt, der hat das Kassel da stehen. Der Unternehmer hat einen Vertrag mit euch. Genau, der Unternehmer hat einen Vertrag mit uns. Das andere im Hintergrund, das machen wir, ist wir und unsere Exchange-Partner. Er sieht nur mehr Euros. Er sagt nur Euros. Er hat die Euros auf sein Konto überwiesen, er hat einen fixierten äh, Betrag, das sieht er doch, oder auf seiner Abrechnung drauf, abzüglich der Gebühr, der Servicegebühr, was wir natürlich einheben, und den Rest kriegt er auf sein Konto überwiesen. Kann man optional auch behalten? Kann man behalten auch, ja. Das heißt, also, also Bitcoin und Ether wollte und wollte dann der Rückweg Genau. Er kann das, er kann, also, es ist sehr, ich kann es auch zahlen. Kann das auch nur in Bitcoin haben? Bitte? Kann das auch nur in Bitcoin haben, selbst wenn wer mit Ether zahlt? Ah, <lacht> das ist das aber angedacht, ja. Zeit, oder? Moment, momentan nicht, momentan kann man es exchangen oder behalten, aber es ist natürlich in Zukunft auch angedacht. Das macht es mit Change, also wird es wurscht sein. Das so zu machen. Er kann jederzeit, kann jeder sich einstellen, äh, ob er, weil es gibt ja Leute, ah, Ripple mag ich überhaupt nicht, das ist der Bankencoin, den tue ich immer aus. Ist natürlich jeden Unternehmer selbstständig möglich. Das selber zu machen, wenn ich sage, okay, ich mag nur Bitcoin drauf haben oder nur Bitcoin haben. Oder Bitcoin und Dash und alle anderen weg, das kann er selber einstellen, da braucht er Umsatz. Das heißt, im Endeffekt habt ihr das ganze äh, Wechselrisiko, was ist mit Fraud, Double Spend oder irgendwelche Geschichten? Äh, das Wechselrisiko tragen wir nicht, also wie gesagt, wenn wir Partner im Hintergrund, die tragen das Wechselrisiko. Okay, aber nicht der Händler. Wie wichtig ist nein, das, dass der alles der Händler, vom Kunden der Händler ist quasi. eben nicht. Ja. Okay. Also wenn ich 50 Euro bei den Händler zahle, kriegt der 50 Euro und, äh, und alles dahinter. Wie viele Gebühren das quasi eingehalten werden oder so, das, das ist der beim Vertrag. Also es gibt da unterschiedlich. Wir haben da zwei Verträge, einmal so eine Art Wertkarten und einmal einen, einen Fixvertrag. Äh, bei dem Wertkarten ist 1,95% und beim, beim äh, fixen Vertrag sind es eben 1,0 bis 1,3. Je nach Volumen, was umgesetzt wird. Mhm. Wir haben uns da natürlich da die gängigsten Sachen von den Kreditkarten angeschaut, wo können wir sich da bewegen. Und viele Unternehmer, die mir da drauf kommen, die kennen sich selber mit ihren Verträgen nicht aus. Wenn dann sage ich, hey, weißt du, ey, aber dann sage ich, ja, nein, das sehe ich zu 1% oder 1,1% bei der Kreditkarten. Äh, 1,3, das ist aber schon so, wie du weißt, aber ich sage, welche Kunden hast du? Ja, viele Firmenkunden, weil ich habe schon Weihnachtsfeiern und ich, weil, weil gestanden ist, einmal im Monat kriegt er die Abrechnung. Also wir haben es einmal in der Woche genauso. Uh, der kriegt eben einmal in der Woche jetzt. Er hat gesagt, ah, ich kann nicht darauf warten, einmal im Monat, ich habe so viele Firmen feiern. Ich sage, was du, was du zahlst, weil die zahlen nicht mit Kreditkarten. Ja, ja, sicher. 1,1 Prozent. Ich sage, nein, 2,5 Prozent. Das ist im Kleingedruckten, wenn du eine Firmenkarte hast oder eine Karte aus dem Ausland, zahlst du wesentlich mehr. Das war es aber keiner. Ich weiß, wo ein Glas ist. Das sind halt die Sachen. Und, uh, man muss auch dann rechnen, wenn Exchange im Hintergrund und alles, die ganze Abwicklung, die bitte schau okay, wenn man vor die Gebühren her sogar niedrig ist. Okay. Wollt ihr das mal irgendwann selber reinholen, dass ihr dann selber auch mehr gemacht oder so, oder dass ihr selber mehr aktiv tradet, als das jetzt nur um den anderen abzugeben, der dann den Trade für euch holt? 
du, was die Zukunft bringt, das weiß ich nicht, aber momentan ist es so, so, dass das der Exchange mit davon macht. Also nicht nur einer, sondern verschiedene. Und es gibt ja auch andere Firmen, mit denen man da in dem Bereich zusammenarbeiten kann. <lacht> Das ist ja das Tolle, wenn man sich da so trifft, weil man findet immer irgendwie eventuell eine Kooperation, also wo man sich austauschen kann. Hm? Was wir heute noch haben? Wir wollen heute noch haben, ja, ja. Vielleicht noch als letzte Frage auf Coin Market Cap gibt es jetzt mittlerweile ich, schon vierstellig oder so an Anzahl an Coins. Ja, über 2000. Ja. Wie, kann man, wie sucht man dann aus, weil ich immer darstellt? Weil irgendwann, wenn ich fünf Minuten scrollen muss, bis genau Mai 0, irgendwas Coin. Also auf ja, das hier, hier limitiert es natürlich dann und ja. sagt, okay, passt, wir nehmen nur die größeren, weil sonst dann überhaupt kein Markt nicht für die los, weil dann kriegen wir auch nicht mehr los. Genau, es geht, es geht ja auch nicht, weil wir müssen ja, ich meine, das macht natürlich der Exchange im Hintergrund, aber wir müssen es natürlich sicherstellen, dass der Coin auch verkauft werden kann. Ja. Weil letztes Mal ist ein M4 über unser Terminal verkauft worden, die Summe muss ja verkauft werden am Markt. Wenn jetzt nicht, in, wenn jetzt habe ich erstmal die Gains Rocks und dieses Stick oder sonst irgendwas, das ist nicht 100 Euro, 50 Euro, was ist das kostet, ganz egal, das ist nicht so schlimm. Aber beim Auto oder je nachdem, also beim Bitcoin und so haben wir ja immer vor 150.000. Der Händler muss natürlich den KYC-Prozess machen. Das muss er sowieso. Aber wir haben ja da, ich meine, die Kooperationen, was wir jetzt gesehen haben, sind schon toll. Aber was da noch kommt, das wird noch viel toller. Was ist mit dem User bezüglich KYC? Im User? Äh, ja, kommt jetzt auch. Ähm, da haben wir sich auch schon was überlegt, eben mit der Wallet, dass das macht. Wenn man bei einem Bankkonto oder bei einem, einer Kreditkarte ist ja auch hinterlegt, wer die. Wenn ich schon weiß, der dann kann ich sehen, dass er das ist. Und das hat sich sonst limitiert, in der Geldmenge, die man auch in anderen Bitte? Das hat sich limitiert in der Geldmenge, die er von jemand annehmen dürft, so eine Liste, wer er ist. Genau, wie beim Bargeld. Das ist, nicht, ist jetzt nichts anderes. Und da muss es sowieso. Das ist ja das, und dann ist eigentlich das Problem, wenn man jetzt mit Bitcoin zahlt, das, ja, das steht ja drinnen, dass die, diese Bezahlung äh, getätigt wurde in der Blockchain. Natürlich weiß keiner jetzt, so, dass ich das bin. Ähm, kann man natürlich, wenn man sagt, man hat ein eigenes Wallet, wo eben die Identität dahinter gelegt ist, kann ich auch sagen, okay, der war das jetzt. Weiters haben wir da auch natürlich schon vorgedacht, wir haben da eine Kamera eingebaut, eben weil man sich dachte, dass sicher irgendwann einmal was kommen wird. Wir waren, das ja mit Bargeld, wenn ich 50.000 so ist, das ist etwas anderes, also mit einer Krypto, also mit, mit, mit einem Wallet geht das fix, das ist gleich drüben oder nur mehr. Deswegen, wir haben da äh, eben eine Kamera eingebaut, wann es eben kommen sollte, dass man das, wenn in vielen Ländern ist, so schaut dass du eben die Leute fotografieren musst bei der Bezahlung oder bei der Behebung von, also wird sowieso gemacht, bei der Geldbehebung wird sowieso schon gemacht und deswegen haben wir da auch äh, ja, weiter gedacht. Aber schauen wir mal, wie weit uns so regulieren. Ich finde das ja gar nicht so negativ, weil meine Witz ist, es gibt dafür, es kämpft da draußen und ich glaube, wenn man ein bisschen was reguliert ist oder geschaut wird, hey, darf das was und nicht nur, wenn bei der FMA wegen Betrugs, Verdacht oder sonst irgendwas anklopfen, sondern auch im Vorfeld, dass sie die Firmen auch registrieren müssen, wissen sie jetzt. Also ab Oktober ist es ja möglich, äh, ab Jänner ist es ja Pflicht, dass sie die Firmen äh, im Kryptobereich, bei der Exchange und alles, äh, registrieren müssen. Wir, wir genauso. Aber so wie wir arbeiten, sonst würde auch eins mit uns gar nicht arbeiten. Wir haben uns natürlich durchleuchtet, ob das alles passt, mit den Verträgen und so. So eine Firma lässt sich nicht auf irgendwo sein. Habt ihr jetzt eine Lizenzen oder müsst ihr eigentlich Nein, Lizenz, nur registrieren, ja? Lizenzen oder? Ja. Aber rechtlich, rechtlich verlangt das ist Gesetz, dass ab ersten, ersten die FMA, du dich bei der FMA registrierst ja. und ab Oktober kannst du quasi einreichen. Wenn du was tust. Ja? Wenn, Wenn du, was du tust. quasi zum Beispiel ein Kryptohändler ja, bist. Ja. Sagen wir mal, Coin finde ich, die muss sich registrieren, Salamantex muss sich registrieren. Das ist doch ganz, ganz schwammig, wie ja, Sie das formuliert ist, haben. Ja, das ist immer das auch durchgelesen. Hey. Also da müssen Sie mal nachbessern, weil sonst, weil es steht eigentlich auch digital Bezahlung. Ist, ist Gott nicht digital Bezahlung? Ja, es ist sehr das schwammig. Ist, also das ist doch also, nicht so. Was, was habt ihr im Tag für Transaktionen? Wie viele 
Möbel stückmäßig was ist die Person? Nein, ein Tag weiß ich jetzt nicht. Oder aber Wochen oder so oder Monat? Ja, im, im, im Juni haben wir glaube ich 95 jetzt oder 95. Also wir haben jetzt draußen 80 Permanents. Achso. Genau. Also es ist natürlich, ja. natürlich mit der Eins und, und der Ingenico Partnerschaft geht das natürlich alles viel schneller. Ihr müsst auch mal eins verstehen, dass im Endeffekt äh, machen wir am Morgen, wenn es noch gar nicht gibt. Für einen Händler. Für uns schon. Wir haben Glück, dass wir wollen damit bezahlt. Aber, aber für einen Händler, teilweise kommt es rein, einer hat mich schon rausgeschmissen. Aber da kommst du halt auch drauf, wie machst du das? Digital bezahlen, neue Kundengewinnung. Wir haben schon einige Autohändler jetzt auch. Also wir haben Apotheken, Autohändler, Restaurants haben wir einige. Äh, Masseurin und, und, und Also von jeder Sparte. Es gibt keine Sparte, wo du sagst, äh, nein, die nicht. Ich komme wieder vor, wir müssen das schon nicht dann benutzen. Aber wollen die Leute tatsächlich bezahlen? Also kannst du so, was haben sie so? Falls du das verraten kannst, du durchschnittliche Transaktionen pro Händler im Monat. Eine Transaktion oder? Nein, das kommt davor. Bei den Restaurants haben wir mehr. Bei ähm, einem Griechen, der hat in zwei Monaten, glaube ich, 70 Transaktionen gehabt. Aber durchschnittlich. Also, das war ja schon. Das war 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 schon. Ja, ich muss sagen, wir haben einige Autohändler. Jetzt ist ein Auto drüber verkauft worden. Das ist jetzt die Masse. Aber man hat schon gemerkt, man merkt es einfach, wenn der Morgen anzieht, dass die Bezahlungen mehr werden. Das merkt man schon. Aber das heißt, morgen ist es derzeit so weit von dir. Ja, sicher. Für das haben wir eh. Also, wir machen nicht nur das, sondern auch mit dem Soccercoin. Also, der Soccercoin passiert ja auf dem, auf dem Jerry-Netzwerk. Und das ist auch, was ich so gesagt mache, mehr auch. Oder? Das kennen sich ja viele noch gar nicht aus in dem Bereich. Da kann nicht auch wir Ratgeber werden. Gerade im Programmierbereich. Ist das Cherry Netzwerk auf Blockchain? Nein, DRG. Frage, Frage, wie lange ist das jetzt schon? Äh, uns gibt es, die Gründung war 2017, im November 2016. So, ich glaube, der Hinterbei hat sich sehr schon ziemlich irgendwie quasi ja. das Bier, gemütliche Bier trinken eingestellt. Ähm, so, da, äh, dann beschließen wir das da heute, wir trinken noch ein paar Bier. Ich bin ja ein dabei. Wir haben nur die letzten Wochen, was irgendwie offen waren, offen leben sind und sagen herzlichen Dank zum Alex. Auch noch. Ich bin